You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that tune means it is time once again for TWIFO this week in Futures Options, a program where we break down everything going on on the other side of the options trading world. We're going to talk some energy, certainly, this week, probably a little bit of ags, a whole bunch of equity and volatility and all sorts of good stuff, plus a bunch of your questions and everything else. Stir it all together. You get the tasty cocktail. That is Twifo. I will be your host, your guide, your major D. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsdecider.com, as well as, of course, from this fine network. Remember, if you like what you hear, not just on this show, but throughout the entirety of the network, keep those reviews coming in your platform of choice. New folks are just discovering the network and mass these days. We want to keep that flow going. It's more important than ever these days. Your reviews are a key contributor to helping all of that happen. So if you like what you hear, keep those reviews coming. Also, keep those questions coming. We do love to hear from you guys let's see who we're hearing from live on the show today first holding down the footsie rutzel hot seat once again it's it's got to be a new record it's like oprah being on the cover of her magazine how could he be on so many times but he has made it yet again mr sean smith the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at footsie russell mr smith welcome back to twifo sir hey mark Thanks for welcoming me back. It's great to be here. I'm re really looking forward to today's show. Should be a fun one. I'm looking forward to it, too, because we are also joined holding down the CME Group hot seat once again by the once and future, which means someday in the dark, dark, distant future, if you all survive 2020, he will have his doctorate and he will become Dr. Vix, a.k.a. Mr. Russell Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program to you as well, sir. Happy to be here. Always happy to be in the hot seat. All right. You're in the hot seat, both of you, in your respective hot seats. Hopefully they're not too uncomfortable for you. Mr. Rhodes, as our guest this week, 
I will allow you the pride of place. Where should we begin our journey to the upside or to, to the dark side? Uh, let's go to the light side, to the upside, uh, just because I, I think I'm going to be surprised to what we see on the upside. It is somewhat surprising. In fact, I'm looking at the scan right now. You guys, as always, listeners, can play the home game. You can listen to the show and then also go to cmegroup.com slash twifo. While you're listening, you can also go to slash twio, T-W-I-O. They both work this week in futures options or this week in options. You can generate your own reports. You can do this market scan like we're doing right now, which will show you that it's weirdly bifurcated this week it's pretty much almost 50 50 on the products over there at cme the big movers to the upside and to the downside we haven't seen that in a while you know we i think we did see it last week but prior to that it was kind of all biased to one direction or the other everything was red or everything was was green it was sometimes hard to find five in one category everything was so biased in one direction this week it's an embarrassment of riches on both sides of the fence, including to the upside, our top five movers over there on CME this week. Number five, listeners, corn up about 3.4%. Remember, this is since our last show on last Thursday. Number four, platinum. I wonder if the Brits call it platinum, like they call it aluminum. I don't know. Either way, it's up 5.5% this week. And before you say, hey, let's break down some platinum. Unfortunately, 47 options contracts on the tape as well this week. So not going to be a big skew and vol story to analyze over there on platinum. That's what we'll call it that, at least. It sounds nice. Sounds regal. Number three, live cattle up five and three quarters percent. That one, a little bit more paper on the tape out there. 19,000 contracts for live cattle. So maybe we can hang our hat out there. Numero dos, lean hogs. So the livestock, the farm animals up there on the upside this week, up 6.08 percent. It was number two to the light side last week as well. So keeping its same spot, it was up about 5.5% last week. And doing some decent paper, our old friend, hashtag Hogla, may have to make a bit of a return appearance because there were about 39,000 contracts on the tape come into Showtime. So pretty active week out there in Lean Hogs. That means number one to the light side yet again, Nat Gas up 14.35%. Uh, it was number three to the dark side last week, off nearly 7%. doesn't matter the week. It's going to be in the top of the upside or the, or the downside every week because it's such a cheap contract. It's kind of almost unfair to include Nat Gas next to some of these other ones. But, hey, it's moving and shaking out there, and it's moving yet again up 14.35%. This week to the dark side. Now it's pretty much all energy all the time here on the dark side. It's kind of been a bit of a dumpster fire week out there in crude oil. We'll get to that in a little bit. Number five, heating oil off six and a quarter percent. It was number two to the dark side last week off 7.15 percent. So a bad couple of weeks for heating oil. Uh, Number four, WTI, similar couple of weeks, similar story for WTI. It's off 6.84 percent since our last show. It was number four also last week. At off nearly 6%, 5.99%. So a bad couple of weeks for WTI as well. Number three, our Bob. You getting a bit of a trend here? I am. Our Bob, number three, off 6.88%. Just barely edging out WTI in the wrong directions. <laughs> More of a loss rather than less. Number two, Brent. We don't see Brent on this tape too often. Brent off 7.71%. It was number five to the dark side last week as well, off 5.06%. So collectively a bad couple of weeks in the energy complex. We're going to break it all down in a little bit. And number one with the bullet to the dark side, we're going to the softs yet again. Two weeks in a row. Lumber just getting annihilated off 9.32%. And by the way, it was number one. To the dark side last week as well, off 15.64%. Now, before you get all excited, only 71 contracts on the tape coming into Showtime. So not a lot to parse there, even though percentage-wise, this is much more of an impressive mover than NatGas because this is a $611 contract. We're not talking $3 range like NatGas. So this thing is actually moving, and it's interesting to see. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of options activity to parse on it. We'd love to sink our teeth into it, but uh, unfortunately, not a lot to parse out there this week. But because we have... The once and future Dr. Vix joining us. We're going to get to all the equity dumpster fire in a second, or excuse me, the crude oil dumpster fire in a second. But we got to tip our hats in equity land yet again. My God, talk about dumpster fires. It's been, it was, I should say, a protracted dumpster fire for quite some time. The better part of the last week out there in equity land since our last show was mostly spent on the blood red side of the tape, with the exception of yesterday where we kind of got a lot of that back. Most of the major indices were rallying again, and today, 
if you listen to the option block a little bit earlier in the day, it was kind of a mixed day. Some of the indices were actually in the green, and NASDAQ was certainly in the green ever so slightly. Now fast forward to TWIFO, not so much. Most of the major indices are firmly in the red out there right now with just blood red across the board. Russell 2000, actually the laggard out there, only off about six-tenths of a percent today at least. That's a weird day where Russell 2000 is... A bit of the laggard. We got the Dow off over 1%, 1.15%. The S&P off about 1.4%. And the NASDAQ off 1.5%. That's after having been positive ever so slightly on the day earlier in the session. So a lot to break down. Coming into showtime, these numbers have obviously changed even since I started talking. Because <laughs> these numbers are moving like crazy. Uh, but coming into showtime, that's when we do the snapshot. We had RBX at about a 32 and a quarter. That put it down about 5 and a quarter handles from last show but if this keeps up if we wait a little bit that's that might be a little bit higher uh vix was at about a 28 and a half i think it was just at ticking at 29 a little bit ago that put it down about three and a half points from our last show a week ago and our old friend vvix which is the vol of vol which says how much these crazy things are moving yes spoiler alert they're moving it's down this week down to about 119 that puts it down 11 and a quarter handles <laughs> from last show that shows how much Things were moving even last week because uh, even down 11 points, it's still at about a 120, which is kind of our barometer for the volatility of volatility. When it gets around 120, we know things are rocking and rolling. Coming into showtime, that spread, that VIX RBX spread, so the large cap to small cap volatility spread had shrunk markedly. I mean, a few few weeks ago, a month and change ago, it was like 13, 14 points. Now it's down to about three and three quarter points. That puts it even almost two points tighter than it was this time last week, and it's well over 10 handles tighter than it was a month and change ago. So a lot popping off out there. That's not enough. we got a new addition to the mix out here. Vol Q, the volatility of the NASDAQ at about a 35.6. puts it down 2.15 handles from where it was where we talked about it on the show with Tim McCourt last week. All right, Mr. Rose, there's a lot of play setting, a lot of things going on in the equity camp. So let's start there, sir. I know you like to crunch the numbers on a little bit of volatility. Spoiler alert, there has been some volatility of late. What's been lighting up your tape out there in the equity space over the past week, sir? Uh, in the equity space, it's the, the the other hot seat that's been uh, catching my eye, which is the Russell 2000. Uh, it, it just what, what is that? To, I'm not familiar with that, sir. The Russell 2000. It's, it seems to, it, it is, Excuse it's an me? index. It's an index that contains about 1,960 stocks. And I can never keep up with the number on it, but it, 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 it's not had the best of 2020s, but I think it's finally starting to do some catch up relative to the S and P 500 and where you're one of the, the, I think one of the confirmations behind that is uh, seeing RVX move down to a closer level to VIX. Uh, I, I did not realize uh, I don't look at things from Thursday to Thursday normally, although I probably should. Uh, but just seeing that RVX, VX is down over five points, while uh, VIX is down about three and a half points from the last show. Uh, I, I think that just confirms some of the things that you're seeing with respect to uh, the Russell 2000 holding in better when the market is down and uh, performing pretty well on up days as well, and just uh, narrowing that uh, performance gap that uh, you know that that occurred in about the first eight months or so of this year, where it was uh, I don't know more than ten percent lagging. Uh, so just it's nice to see confirmation in the volatility indexes uh, for something that I, I've been waiting to happen and appears to start to 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 start happening now. A little bit out of out of the range of the show, but I can't help but talk about VBIX, uh, even though it's down from one thirty to around one nineteen from the last show. That is still a really high level, and until you see VBIX under a hundred uh, and consistently under a hundred, I just think that the equity market volatility that has been most of 2020 is going to continue. Uh, I, I think, think more professionals use VIX options. If they're paying up for VIX options, that means there's an expectation of a tail event or two over the next 30 days. And until that comes off, I think we're we're what has been 2020, a lot of going up fast, coming down fast. It's going to continue. Speaking of 2020, and you're right, this is a little bit farther afield, but the volatility of volatility is an interesting topic no matter where you're looking. And it certainly is interesting out there in equity land. We're just talking on our last show. You know, we usually use that 
barometer, that frame of reference on our volatility view show for VBIX, which is the volatility of volatility listeners, of 75 is kind of the downward kind of band. Doesn't really get much below that before vol starts moving again. And around 120 is where on the upside, like I said earlier, that's kind of where you really have to start paying attention. That's really where things are frothy. We've been living beyond 120 for quite a while this year. In fact, this whole year, the frame of reference for the volatility of volatility, you just throw it out the window. We haven't dipped really below 90 too much. A, a brief dip, I think to about 86 or 87 back in mid-January. And that was about it. We haven't really looked back. So the volatility of volatility has really just been off to the races over the better part of this past year. So forget about that 75 downward band. We're really talking about probably 95 for the better part of the COVID era here. So volatility in this pandemic time, a little bit of a different beast. And that's certainly worth analyzing here. Mr. Mr. Sean, you're holding down our FTSE Russell hot seat. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, you heard him just break down the comparative performance of small caps versus large caps. What's been lighting up your tape in small cap world since the last time we chatted, sir? You know, I'm watching both. I'm watching the Russell 1000 and the 2000 large cap versus small cap. And it's been as as Russell. And, and welcome to the show, Russell. It's always good to have you on the show. Um, and, and, and the fact that your name is Russell and we're talking about the Russell indexes just makes it all that more special for me today. So, um, uh, welcome to the show. Great. Always great to have you, but, um, Thanks. yeah, lar- always welcome. My friend, um, large caps versus small caps, you know, Russell 1000, uh, you know, quarter to date's up 10 percent ish and the Russell 2000 is up, you know, 6% quarter to date. And I, and I mentioned quarter because year to date, uh, large caps are up just under seven percent, and and small caps, the Russell 2000, are down seven and a half percent for the year. But as as Russell said in his words, and I like to say in mine, the s- small caps like to outperform to the downside. But as we all know, when uh, things are getting better in the U.S. economy, uh, small caps outperform to the upside. And I actually, and today. I think you mentioned that uh, uh, the the Russell is performing better than than the other indices, and you and you gotta you gotta just think about small caps in terms of sectors, right? It's less less tech weighted than uh, our other benchmarks like large caps. So I think that's a reason why you see the the volatility coming in as you do uh, the way Russell uh, 2000 uh, RVX is coming in the way it is. Uh, and why that spread has tightened because the different different weights of the different indices are obviously affecting the performance of these indexes on a daily basis with some some tremendous vol. And I agree with you in regards to VIX being over a hundred. Yeah, you got to get it below a hundred uh, uh, consistently, um, um, Russell. I completely agree with your comments there. But uh, um, yeah, interesting times. Volumes just continue to be strong in in the the Russell uh, complex at CME group in terms of the Russell 2000 and the Russell 1000. I've been bringing up the RS1 product uh, on the show uh, as of recently. That large cap index is something that I I hope uh, your listeners are also taking a look at is that that Russell one future that's uh, uh, gaining some attraction and uh, activity these days. But uh, yeah, interesting, interesting times, and I couldn't agree with you more, Russell, in your in your perspective on the markets. Well, let's break down some of that activity out here. Let's start in the Russell two thousand land coming to showtime. We're seeing on the week here, so this weekend, obviously coming in on this week here, uh, Russell two thousand off, not quite a full percent, about a little north of three quarters of a percent at about a fifteen eighteen in that front future. But where the action was this week is in the SEP contract with a mere eight days to go. So the weekly's hot and heavy. You know, I don't like looking at skew with less than two weeks to go, listeners. But, you know, I'll make an exception in this case because 42.5% of the paper went up out here in this contract. The puts last week, almost 10% rich, 9.9% rich. This week, 116 So the puts are getting bit up even more. Not exactly surprising. The call, 7.7% cheap. This week, even cheaper, 10.3%. We've seen a bit of a sell-off, a bit of a pullback out there. Not exactly surprising out there as well and the big dog out here for the couple of weeks in a row now it's kind of been upside calls it's the same week sep with about a week to go 16 double calls 1655 calls lighting it up this week which is kind of surprising if you know anything about russell 2000 options over there on cme listeners you know that 
people like to play in those farther off out of the money puts. That's where most of the action has been. And yet this week, yet again, 1655 calls, well over 100 handle out of the money calls uh, lighting it up. They were closing on Wednesday, but more paper lighting it up today. So maybe some more repositioning out here. We don't have today's OI change, obviously, but interesting stuff. Maybe someone, someone getting the heck out of Dodge looks like on Wednesday, but they traded even more today. So. Not sure what's up with these, but it's a strange strike nonetheless. Speaking of strange products out here, Mr. Rhodes, there has been a new addition to the CME equity and indeed volatility family. We talked about it a little bit last week with Tim McCourt, but it is coming up on the radar here. It is the NASDAQ 100 volatility products So CME getting back into the vol game. They've had a few vol products over the years, I use products loosely because most of them haven't really been tradable. Of course, we have the much missed OIV, which was an index, not really a tradable product. Uh, we had the euro dollar realized, or not euro dollar, it was the euro, I should say, realized vol product that was short lived over there at CME and a bunch of other co licensed branded things with SIBO in terms of gold and everything else out there. But tradable products on the vol space, they have been few and far between for CME, but now bringing those old nation shares products, the vol decks and the skew decks, transferring them over to the NASDAQ. So that's effectively listeners taking VIX and then cutting off the wings, cutting off the calls and the puts, just looking straight up at the money vol. And this time looking at it over there on the NASDAQ. And it's certainly hard to argue that NASDAQ doesn't warrant it. A lot of vol out there. In fact, I talked last week. If you haven't checked it out, let listeners, Eric Norland over there at CME did a, a great research piece on comparing on the NASDAQ 100 vol versus S&P 500 vol, a lot of interesting things. Is that volatility ratio has, was at peak levels. This is about a week and change ago when he wrote this paper. He also noted that NASDAQ 100 options in his terms had decoupled from the S&P 500 options. He thought maybe some of the memories of the tech wreck were driving to these inflated premiums he was noting out there in NASDAQ 100. So a lot to parse. I know, Russell, when you're not here talking on our show, you're over there crunching a lot of content for the NASDAQ folks. What are your thoughts on this new addition to the vol space and uh, any interesting nuggets of research you found in your work, sir? Well, I, first off, I think it's great that uh, vol Q futures are coming and, uh, you know, I, I, nothing's been announced yet, but I have a funny feeling we're going to see vol Q options sooner th- rather than later once. And so we'll have a, a full tradable complex for a different volatility measure. Uh, and it, it it's calculated differently. I like how you put the uh, – it's kind of like VIX but cut the wings off. That's a really good way to put it since uh, I think 16 options go into the VOLQ calculation. Feel free uh, to and- borrow that, sir. My licensing rates are very reasonable. I, I just I really like that because somebody asked me I, I had a discussion earlier today on uh, the VOLQ uh, uh, calculation methodology versus the VIX methodology uh, and VXN, which is out there, uses the VIX methodology as well. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to do some work where I look at those two versus each other because I think it'd be a really good uh, at the money versus out of the money uh, implied volatility comparison. Uh, but going back to VOLQ versus VIX, I, that is something that uh, I was keeping an eye on back with VXN versus VIX a long time ago when there was actually tradable futures on VXN for a short period of time. And I think that there's actually, because there's there's two different components this time. Uh, instead, you know, there's a different underlying, but then there's a different measurement methodology as well. So, you know, and sometimes the wings are more expensive, especially on the put side relative to other times, like right now, because we keep talking about uh, you know, skew is as high as it is, and VVIX is typically really high when um, when the wings are elevated. So I think it's kind of interesting that VOLQ is at as much of a premium as it is relative to uh, VIX right now, uh, but I, I just think it's going to be a fun comparison going forward because of the the real differences between the two. You know, one's at the money, one includes the whole strip of options, one's a bunch of tech stocks for the most part, and the other one's basically, you know, a bunch of big multinational companies. Yeah, you know, a lot to parse. I'm looking forward to that product getting listed. We'll always love to have more products, actual tradable products in the ball space. There's a lot of abstract indices floating around out there like VBIX that are all certainly informative, but we like things you can actually sink your teeth into and trade, and certainly our audience does as well. So a new addition to the volatility trading realm is certainly interesting. And it's interesting as well to kind of strip out the other information on the wings there and just focus solely on the at-the-money perspective. It's certainly 
a much more simplistic way to view it, which I think a lot of people want. There clearly is a market for just that. They don't want what some people call the noise of the wings. I think the wings provide a lot of interesting information. It's a question of how do you parse it and how do you analyze it? And some folks obviously thinking uh, maybe the way the SIBO did it wasn't the best way. And so as a result, stripping all that out, you get rid of that noise and you get focused on the at the money ball. It'll be interesting to see when all this launches, how the market responds and where they have a preference, maybe for the at the money or they like the full strip in Vixland. Either way, there's going to be a lot of trading back and forth as well, which I think will certainly be interesting. Sean, any other thoughts here on A, maybe this new addition to the CME Vol family, B, the prospects for some new uh, maybe Russell 2000 Vol products in the near future, or C, anything else catching your eye in the equity Vol tape before we move on to the raging dumpster fire that is energy, sir? Well, we, you know, we brought up, uh, we brought up uh, these products and we brought up um... Uh, we actually, with Tim McCourt last week, we brought up micro options as well um, and the launch of, of those options. Uh, and I think we put some really good client demand uh, uh, noise in his ear about uh, bringing Russell micro options up when, if, when the time comes because of client demand as well. So hopefully we see those. But I, again, I, I agree with the conversation uh, we're having today. New products only enhance uh, the ability of our of our customers to one hedge their risk. All of these all of these products, including uh, this new volatility product, are only going to enhance our our customers' ability to trade. So it's all it's always exciting to see these new products. It's it's exciting to see them take off too in terms of volume and open interest. So I'll I'll be keeping my eyes on on these products. But uh, you know RVX is is another one of those examples where we need to uh, we need to to bring a product back as well. So that's uh, uh, something Russell and I have had nice, long, passionate conversations about in terms of, in terms of products. So, um, yeah, I welcome innovation. I welcome answering, uh, bringing solutions to, to clients' problems and, and answering those, those problems with product. And it seems to be the case here. He certainly is an old school fan of RBX. Back in the day when it was a listed product and our volatility views program is the only thing that would talk about it. We'd have Russell on there and he would, he would discuss it. So it would be good to see small cap vol as an actual tradable product. Sounds like we may be making our way there, Sean. There's enough vol certainly out there. Speaking of vol, uh, we can't ignore, as I've said before, the, the raging dumpster fire that is the energy space right now. You guys always want us to talk energy regardless. So WTI makes it onto the show a lot. It's a very popular fan favorite. This week, I think we're legally obligated to discuss all things energy. We're going to skip off Nat Gas, even though it is number one, just because, like I said, it's such a small contract. Percentage-wise, it can move all over the place, and it's not that hard to make it the top of the list. But WTI... We've been talking for a while, you know, the options paper is seemingly fading below 40. I woke up this morning, my briefing on my smart speaker was talking about the options flow said WTI was pointed south. That's how widespread this information is getting now, listeners. Even my smart speaker is telling me such things when I wake up in the morning for my briefing. But that certainly has paid off over the past a few weeks out here. Back below the 40 handle yet again, coming into Right now, we're seeing WTI at about a 37.10 out there, so roughly three handles shy of that much-watched 40 handle. Vol, as you might imagine, pretty firm, pretty frothy out there with the most active contract right now is that October contract. It's got about a whopping <laughs> a whopping seven days to go, listeners. So that shows you people will trade weeklies and short-duration contracts in WTI. Just not if it's a listed weekly. They, they don't touch that for some reason. But when the monthly contracts have a week or so to go, they'll trade them up. And that's the case this week. 41.5% of the paper coming in this contract. The vol out there, 54.80 listeners. They're roughly 55 points, up nearly 15 points uh, from last year. We're getting into Bitcoin territory now. We made a joke on our option block program last week. Apple's at a similar volatility level right now. So you have mega caps crude oil and Bitcoin all trading around a 60 volatility. That shows you where we are in the world right now. Listen, what it takes to have a mega cap like Apple at roughly 60 odd volatility, let alone what's cooking out here in products like WTI. You know, I don't like breaking down ball and skew with less than two weeks to go. But again, so much of the paper was here. It'd be kind of foolish to ignore. At least it has about a week to go. So 
<laughs> read into that what you will. Last week, the puts were leading the dance out here, 23.3% rich. This week, coming in a little bit, 15.2%, but we have seen a big move, so some of that may be coming off the table, people taking those positions off. Not exactly surprising. The calls last week, 14.4% cheap. This week, 117 so ever so slightly more a bid but again this is a week to go so that read into those numbers with a bit of a grain of salt let's look out here what the most active contract was this week if you said 35 puts with about a week to go you are the winner winner chicken dinner Seventeen thousand six hundred of those bad boys on the tape the lion's share on tuesday nearly nine thousand about fifty six hundred today and thirty one hundred on wednesday remember monday was closed with labor day holiday listeners so no paper on those days a lot of back and forth on this strike as this strike clearly coming into the into the view now as we've blown past the 30 strike again we also saw 35 puts pretty active out here in november these bad boys doing oh a little bit less about sixteen thousand three hundred. still very active paper here on these november 35 puts the lion's share tuesday 9800 2000 yesterday zero today which is kind of surprising. So all that paper coming pretty much earlier in the week. Let's go back really quickly to this one week to go contract, see if any other paper is really lighting up our tape out there. Yeah, we also saw the 40 calls. So they're not quite forgotten. They're still in the rear view mirror there with about 13,200 on the tape. The lion's share also on Tuesday, 6,300. Wednesday, about 3,700. And today, about 3,200. Most of that opening, actually. So opening paper on the 40 strike as we kind of drift towards it and break through it and move beyond it uh, out there. Interesting stuff. Maybe some folks positioning for a rebound. Maybe they're overriding uh, the way that skew is moving. It's kind of hard to read into it. again. It's only a week to go. So let's go a little bit farther out really quickly just to check on that skew. Let's go to another month that was pretty active. November had about 26% of the paper, the vol out there, listeners, 49 and a quarter, up about nine and a quarter points. It has a little over a month to go. So a little bit more sane readings out here. Uh, the, night, the puts were 19% bid last week, this week, 15.8%. So coming in a little bit, the calls, 13.5% cheap last week. Similar level this week, 12.9% cheap this week. So the calls haven't changed as much, but the puts coming in a little bit. So we're seeing a similar paper out here. On the, maybe maybe some folks are liking themselves. <laughs> that 35 strike, maybe they're drawing a line in the sand on that 35 strike. A lot of back and forth paper really on that strike. So Kind of hard to read into that. Let's go a little bit farther out to see if there's any other weird prints before I toss it over to Mr. Rhodes, who's also been watching all things crude dumpster fire out here. Let's like the 30 puts in Dece, also where the action is this week, listeners. Nearly 10,000 on the tape. All of that coming on Tuesday, 8,971. A couple hundred today, a couple hundred yesterday, but a lot on Tuesday. Good chunk of that opening. So 30 puts opening in Dece. Maybe a sign... That you know, there are there's talk about a little bit more of an economic slowdown now with the jobs numbers coming out today, growing international demand that was maybe seen to drive crude back north of 40. Maybe that's mitigating again. Summer driving season is behind us here in the U.S. A lot of reasons why perhaps crude demand may not be as strong. And perhaps this 30 strike in Dece is reflecting that out there. What are your thoughts on where crude's going to be? What about these positioning on these, on these strike listeners? You guys love yourselves a little bit of WTI. Hit us up. Let us know out there. Mr. Rhodes, I know you watch yourself a little bit of crude. It's kind of been hard to ignore this week, that's for sure. It's kind of top of mind on the on the commodity side for a lot of people out there. Anything catching your eye out there, vol-wise, skew-wise, or anything else in crude oil this week, sir? It looks, you know, like you mentioned, we're kind of hitting a support level here. And from what I can tell, I've been digging through a bunch of different energy contracts while you were uh, talking there. It looks to me like there's some concern we're going to break some support and keep going to the downside. So I would be a bit concerned or I would not be surprised if the next time you have me on, crude oil is on the dark side. <laughs> How's that for a little little preview for the next time i'm here because it, it does look like uh mo there's more option concern to the downside it's I, I i think it's funny you picked out that 30 price point because i think long term that might be a price point that uh thinks it's going to get tested so and and again the the option market seems to be appears to be uh, a little bit 
more concerned about the downside than a quick bounce back to the upside. And uh, options skew and commodities, I, I think it's one of the most underutilized tools out there. And I think it's one of the most useful tools out there uh, just because sometimes market participants are truly more concerned about a drop and sometimes market participants are much more concerned about a big move to the upside and you know in this case right now even though we're we're bordering on lower levels i think even more lower levels are in our future that certainly can be the case. By the way, what's this you're looking ahead to your next appearance? You didn't, you didn't get the note. This is your Oh, last I don't know. One. Just this whenever. One and done, sir. <laughs> Assuming future appearances. What are you, what are you doing over here? <laughs> right. But you're right. A lot, to, lot popping off here this week. Let's get to some others quickly here on our big movers and shakers this week. I know we have a lot of ag fans out there. I want to make sure we rope in a little bit of corn. Corn, a pretty popular product out there. It's number five on our light side this week. Let's see really quickly where we are. That front corn future, 365 and a half exactly that puts it up 2.1 percent or so on the week here listeners the most active contract in corn right now the dece contract 38.5 percent of the paper going up out there the vol pretty frothy in corn land as well 21 and three quarters that's up two and a third points just from last week so corn vol creeping up there a little bit everything's getting frothy out there in vol land right now the most active con oh, before we get to that let's look at the skew here in this dece contract the puts last week 1.7 percent cheap this week nearly four percent cheap 3.8 percent cheap calls 3.8 percent rich this week 5.1 percent rich we have a question i think later about <laughs> where do collars set up something like that is helpful for a collar you probably want a little bit starker contrast between the call wing and the put wing but it's getting there. That's that's a nice start there. It seems like the ags are a favorable place for collars, at least these days. Uh, let's see. Uh, 38.5% of the paper in this Dece contract. The number one print out here this week, listeners, was actually not in Dece, though. It was actually in January. This was actually in March. The March 380s. 17,656 of the March 380s. Lighting up the tape. That is about 15 handles out of the money right now, listeners. The big print today, 13,000 and change going up today. 3,700 yesterday. Uh, interesting. So 380s on the tape out there in March in the year of 2021, which we all hope and pray can't come fast enough. <laughs> then we go out to the D's contract again. We got the 340 puts, which are also fairly out of the money. About 25 handles out of the money. Lighting up the tape with about 15,500, 8,000 was the big day. That was on Wednesday. Uh, the rest, about 3,700 and change. Almost exactly even trading on Tuesday and today, which is kind of weird. Uh, biased back and forth, so not a lot, a lot of change OI-wise on these 340 puts here as well. And also active right behind it again, kind of going all over the place here. But going back to Ock, which has about 15 days ago, 365 calls. Also active there with 14,000, almost 15,000, 14,984 on the tape. So maybe a bit of a roll. All that going up today as well. So maybe a bit of a funky roll on 365s uh, from, what was this, October out there. Maybe uh, maybe a 380s in March. <laughs> maybe that's a bit of a stretch. But either way, both of those are pretty active. 10,262 of these 365s going up in October today. And the rest, about 3,400 yesterday, 1,200 on Tuesday. Total of about 15,000 on the tape out here. All right, really quickly, let's go on. We want to get some of your questions, too. We want to squeeze in a couple more categories. Well, really quickly, Mr. Rose, do you have anything to add on all things corn or perhaps anything ag in general, sir? Uh, the ag, I haven't been paying nearly as much attention to the ags as I should be. Uh, the, I find the lumber thing, I know this is not what you just asked, but I did find the lumber thing pretty interesting because the last headline I had seen on lumber was limit up. <laughs> and that was like two weeks ago and now it's limit down. So there's probably something to be done in that, uh, in, in that, uh, it, it, trade lumber volatility, something I'd never thought about before. Yeah, if you did trade, you'd be one of the seventy-one contracts that have traded this week. Sir. I, so you'd you'd have I'd some be a side, big part of the open. You interest. would be maybe all of the open interest, uh, Doctor yeah. Rhodes, the lumber baron known as, as Doctor Bix. <laughs> he traded a ten lot. Yes. You are dominating the tape, sir. 
Uh, the lumber king of Chicago. Yes, the lumber baron known as the once and future Dr. Vicks. Let's move on really quickly to another one that's been lighting it up of late. A little bit of hashtag hog love out there. Keeping it in the ag cycle, but moving on to the livestock. Lean hogs, of course, number two to the light side this week, up 6.08% since our last show. They were also number two the week before, up 5.5%. As of this week, so this weekend, starting in from Monday here, they're up another 7.61%. So just crazy week here for lean hogs, 64 and a third or so. That's roughly where they are if you're not following the lean hogs day to day. Let's see. Most of the action, though, listeners, coming in this contract in October that has roughly, yeah, has roughly 33, 34 days to go out here so not no real weekly action in the lean hogs but still almost forty thousand contracts on the tape that compares to uh similar actually it's like about yeah about similar level last week as well pretty active couple of weeks here for lean hogs and of that nearly 50 percent of the paper in this october contract let's see let's go to the vol first the vol actually in 33 is the vol out there in lean hogs right now off about two and a half handles so if you're wondering, that's just a front contract. There, you got the D's that ticks up quite a bit. It's up to 44 and a quarter. It's a 12 point vol difference, listeners, between the October and the D's contract. That's that's a pretty hefty term structure there, from a vol perspective. Let's look to where the puts are trading and the calls here in October right now. This most active contract, 50 percent of the paper, 4.4 percent cheap were the puts last week. This week, 16.7 percent rich. Wow, these puts. Got bid up pretty pretty dramatically here. The call is 7.3% rich last week. This week, 9.2% cheap. Wow. So this rally has kind of blown through a lot of strikes, and we're seeing kind of a traditional movement on the skew, but very, very exaggerated here. We're seeing the puts getting bid up and the calls coming in. It's what you typically see on a skew move. Usually when one this exaggerated, you don't see it like this, a big move like this. You might see it not follow the skew as traditionally, but this one seems like it's doing so and doing so with gusto. Calls getting annihilated, puts getting bid up as you move up. So that skew rotating a little bit. Let's see the most active contract out here, the 60 calls with about 3,000 contracts on the tape. Remember, there's about 40,000 contracts total. So a little bit lighter product, but still Heck of a lot more than the 71 in lumber. The lion's share, let's see, 1,300 today, 800 on Wednesday, whopping 400 on Tuesday. Total of about 2,600 or so out here for these 60 calls. That's where the action is in lumber. Unless we forget out here before we get some of your questions, interesting new announcement from CME. You guys like yourselves some tools. And it's a complex we don't get a chance to sink our teeth into that often. This is FX. A lot of it is because a lot of this paper actually dovetails with what's going on on the OTC side of the fence. That's where a lot of FX goes up, obviously. Uh, CME trying to make that conversion between their listed products and the OTC FX world a little bit easier to do. They launched what's called the FX Options Volatility Converter Tool. The name pretty much says it all. They say here at a time when Market participants are looking for efficiencies and ways to lower their cost of trade. This is the first ever tool to price their listed FX options in OTC terms. So helping FX traders to more easily monitor price relationships between the listed and OTC markets. So this is an interesting one out here. It kind of helps you. Obviously, you see this in the vol space as well. Products are quoted differently. They have different structure, different format, different pricing, all sorts of different things. So if you're doing a lot of size in the OTC space and you want to translate some of that to the listed, it's kind of hard sometimes to make that jump. So this tool obviously designed to help migrate some of that paper over from the OTC side to the listed side at CME. Yeah, not a huge retail-oriented story, but still an interesting one. Mr. Rhodes... What are your thoughts here on this tool? I'm not sure you probably haven't tried it yet, but any thoughts? This is kind of analogous to what we see in the OTC vol space as well, right? Where we see a lot of products, you know, variant swaps over here, FX, something similar, where they quote their own, kind of their own rules of engagement, trying to translate these to the listed world a little bit more, Mr. Rhodes. No, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm actually playing around with it right now uh, since, you, since you brought it up. Uh, and it's pretty interesting just looking at the, um, you know, the, the skew by Delta going out of the money in both directions, down, down to the put side and up to the call side. Uh, it's uh, the, the data looks cool. I'd like to see it on a chart. I'll bet you it'd be a really cool because um, they're showing everything from a one day tenor to a one year tenor. Uh, so you practically have 
Um, if you wanted to convert this to volatility indexes, you would have everything from a one week, two week, three week, one month, two month, three month, six month, nine month, and one year uh, at the money vol you know at the money volatility measure uh, using the 50 delta options. And if they've got enough history for you, there might be some really interesting things to do there with respect to you know when are the big global financial markets moves sneaking up on us? Not surprisingly. Uh, the 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 implied volatility jumps about two months from right now, which would be uh, if which would be what uh, eleven ten, uh, just a few days after the U.S. election. Not surprisingly at all, dips a month from now and pops up two months from now, and then dips three months from now. That replica it actually looks a lot like. Uh, with different numbers, but number-wise, it looks a lot like uh, the volatility curve, the volatility that you see from at the money, even Russell 2000 options that expire just before the election and just after the election, and then in December when we have some anomalies. Uh, so I, you, you've, I'm going to end up staring at this thing and playing around with it for an hour this afternoon. You've just cost me another hour. Well, you are welcome, sir. That's, that's what we live for here to distract Dr. Rhodes, or the soon-to-be Dr. Rhodes. And it's time for you guys to distract us with a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, let's see what you guys have on the brain. Since we are joined by the once and future Dr. Vicks, let's rope this one in as well. We have a fast and furious, hot and heavy volatility poll going on right now for you guys out there. The listeners, it was kicked off on our volatility views program last week. We had seen our old friend, uh, the Vicks Cash, a.k.a. Large Cap Vol, out there. Ticking north of the 30 handle again. It closed at almost 31, about 30 and three quarters at the end of our show there. So we thought we'd ask you guys, as we do on that show, we try to predict Vol going into the future. We thought we'd give you guys a chance and say, hey, you know, VIX almost 31. Are you guys buying this new level of, of vol or is this kind of a mere blip on the radar? We gave you four choices that we were wanting to do. If you haven't voted yet, a lot of you have. If you haven't voted yet, get on over there to add options that expires within the next day or so before showtime. Wouldn't be fair to have it go through showtime. You guys at the end of the poll here are getting a little bit of an advantage as well. But we'll we'll allow it just for fun. But let's see here. We gave you four choices. Gave you some ranges here of volatility. Uh, 30 to 33, so right around here where it was at the time we posted the poll. A little bit higher, so north of 33. A little bit lower, which is 27 to 29.99, which is pretty much where we find ourselves right now. Of course, I, I haven't checked. We may have ticked back north of that uh, 30 level as we're talking. Oh, close to it. Not quite there yet. And then, or much lower, south of 27. Mr. Rhodes, without looking at our notes here, sir, do you have a vote in our poll, A? And then B, more importantly, where do you think our audience is lining up? Oh, goodness. I forgot the, the range that was just over 30. What was that? There's 30 to 33, and then there's north of 33. A 30 to 33. That's I couldn't remember if you said 30 to 32 or 30 to 33. That's what, but there you go. 30 to 33. All right, Mr. Sean, do you have a vote in our poll, sir, before I reveal our answers for the masses? Um, I'm going to say north of 33. Feeling a little bit of all. I, I can get with that. I was with that on our show last week, so my crystal ball prognostication has still about 24 hours to come true. So we all know that's an eternity in the vol space. We're threatening the 30 handle, so we're heading in the right direction for my prediction. Right now, listeners, you guys have always been north of 33 ever since this poll went live, and it still is the leader with about, it was 33.1%. Let's see if that's changed since the start of the show. It's actually 33% exactly now 
with some new voting coming in for higher north of 33, followed by 24 and a half percent for lower 27 to 29 point nine nine, which is technically where we are right now. So maybe some of the later votes bias towards that uh, 23 point eight percent, much lower. So south of 27 and then 18 point eight percent saying in the pretty much where it was range of 30 to 33. So we shall see tomorrow. Who is right? Our audience typically tends to fade and lean on the higher vol side of the fence. You're a bit of a cynical bunch from a vol perspective. I like that about you. Let's go on out to speaking of cynical bunch. <laughs> this, we were talking on the show last week uh, with Tim McCourt, and we said, why, why would CME want to launch a new uh, vol product in the equity space? And frequent listener options game <laughs> cynic that he is chimed in and said to make money. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that options game. We Looking at it the deeply, just straightforward way, yes. But I think there are other considerations which we discussed last week on the show. The fact that there's probably some opportunity out there in the vol space. It's kind of crowded around the S&P 500 right now. A little bit of a room on the NASDAQ side to maybe make a bit of an impression. And also, like we talked about this week and last week, a different methodology, going back old school, going back straight up at the money. Don't mess around with out-of-the-money puts that can get carpet bombed or out-of-the-money calls. Straight up at-the-money straddle runs, pretty much what you're getting out there in the ball queue. It sounds like there might be an audience for it. But yes, at the end of the day, they are a public company. They do want to make some money on it, too. Thanks for pointing that out there. Our audience, getting cynical these days out there. I, I kind of like it. Uh, all right, Mr. Rhodes, I'll have you. This will be your one. This comes from Underhill. I know you're such an ag head. That's why this one makes me just leap out to you. Underhill wants to know, I have a question about futures options. Well, you sent it to the right show, Underhill. You passed the first test. The next one, what exactly happens when you hold a commodity futures options contract until expiration? Let's say I bought five corn contracts. What would happen if I held them until expiration? Mr. Rhodes, diehard corn magnet that you are, sir. <laughs> what do you have to say here for Mr. Underhill, who's scared he's going to get a truck of corn coming to his house, sir. He's not going to get a truck of corn. Um, what actually happens is typically the options expire before the futures. So what you end up with is you end up with a um, you end up with a position in the futures contracts. And I'm just going to use hypothetical numbers here, but let's say that you you own a six dollar call and you you um, and you. I don't know, you paid a buck for it or whatever, but it, it's in the money and you hold it through expiration. You're going to end up with, uh, let's say it's at seven fifty. You're going to get a buck fifty times whatever the multiplier is on the contract, and you're going to get a corn future with a cost basis of six. That's that's technically how it works. Uh, but the options expire before the futures. Now, if you hold the future through and i think that might be where what part of the question is uh you will end up owning corn but you end up getting a uh you get a receipt that says it's in a warehouse somewhere on your behalf um but i have a funny feeling a lot of people's brokers will get them out of the futures before that happens in this day and age yeah i was going to point that out so, it kind of depends yeah. where you're trading it a lot of the retail brokers and i'm guessing it's on the retail side just doing like a three lot somewhere your broker is going to shut that down before you even get to the warehouse portion where as you mentioned you're not going to get a truck you're going to get some receipt for a deposit at a warehouse if it gets to that stage and you have to pay storage costs and everything else like that which is all sorts of fun but your broker probably has all sorts of processes in place and it kind of de varies depending on brokers so i would caution you to contact your broker and see exactly how they handle this process but on the options side mr road is correct if you're wondering by the way that cme corn contract is for five thousand bushels so a truck would show up with a fair amount of corn <laughs> if that were indeed to happen thankfully there are some safeguards in place to keep that. We get this all the time. It seems like it keeps popping up. People have this fear of the truck of whatever, truck of oil, truck of corn, just showing up at their house and just, just dumping it on their front lawn. Thankfully, a few safeguards in place to prevent that, uh, that sort of thing from happening. All right, Tony. Tony wants to know, where are the collars lining up this week? Well, I was talking about this earlier, uh, Tony. We talked last week, soybean meal was pretty favorable. Soybeans in the past have been historically Collar favorable. I think that's the case for a lot of the major ags. If you're looking for one complex that's going to be more collar friendly than others, it's probably the ags. You know, other products will swing, metals will swing. What you want, obviously, is a strong bid to the calls and a very, very cheap price for the puts. So no bid at all uh, to the puts out there, which clearly throws equities out of the bunch there because equities pretty much never have that shape. The puts are always expensive, the calls are always cheap. 
So not really very collar friendly. But and the ags where there is some concern to the upside, things like subsidies uh, cause a little bit of upside concern out there. That causes a bid to those calls. And also they can move around quite a bit. So right now we just talked about corn. Puts are kind of cheap out there in corn. Calls are kind of expensive. I wouldn't say it's a collar bonanza yet. You want those puts to get cheaper and the calls to get much more expensive out there. But in general, last week was soybean meal. I'll have to pull up and see if that's still the case. And this week, corn. I would add corn to that rotation as well. So in general, Tony and everyone else who has similar questions out there, where is the collars? Where's the collar game this week? In general, if you start digging through the ags, you could find – let me just go really quickly. We're running up against it, but let's pull it up here. Since you asked so nicely, uh, Tony, let's go back out to soybean meal. Well, specifically the meal last week that had a nice nice setup to it. Let's see if that's still the case this week. Let's see. 50% of the paper going up in Dees in the soybeans. Yeah, it looks pretty interesting. Last week, the puts were 3.4% cheap. This week, even cheaper. 6.6% cheap. And the calls getting a little bit more bid up. The calls were 5.6% rich this week, 6.8%. So calls bid. Actually, they're equidistant. 6.6% cheap. 6.8% 6.8% rich to the calls, so pretty much equidistant calls, bid, puts, offered. That sounds like a pretty attractive collar setup, so maybe you want to go out to Dees Soybean Meal. I'm not sure if that's your product of choice. I wouldn't go there just for the collar, but if you're intrigued by it, it might be an interesting place to hang your hat out there in collar land. All right, we got to run up against it. I'm going to have to probably save this correlation a question for next week because I know, Sean, uh, you're coming up against it here as well. There we go. All right, listeners, unfortunately, that music means we come to the end of another epic journey through the world of futures options. What a journey it was. We talked equity vol, NASDAQ, and Russell 2000, S&P, and everything else. A little bit of VIX thrown in there as well. We talked a lot of energy. Talked some hashtag hog love. FX got into corn and soybeans and collars and what happens if the corn truck shows up at your house spoiler alert probably won't a lot of other fun stuff as well but before we go let's go back around the horn let's start with our guest mr rhodes if folks are intrigued i want to hit you up maybe about nasdaq vol all the things cooking off over there or anything else you're working on mr rhodes i heard a rumor you may have a book coming out if folks want to check it out where should they go what should they do uh, well, the book the book will be out at the end of October, uh, the VIX Traders Handbook, which is a, a big update on uh, trading VIX derivatives, which is almost 10 years old now. Uh, otherwise, whenever I'm writing up things on, and I'll be writing things up as a vol Q comes to CME Group, uh, and I'm, I'm expanding into lots of different markets uh, in, in putting it in front of the paywall at eqderivatives.com. Typically, when I publish something, I'll tweet it out and uh, tweet it out with the link to how you get to it, again, without having to go behind the paywall. Give him a follow over there on the Twitters if you haven't done so already. is a good follow in between episodes of the show at Russell Rhodes. Two S's, two L's, and Rhodes is R-H-O-A-D-S. I don't know why he spells it that way. You have to ask him. He can't just go the easy way. What fun is it if it's easy? Give him a follow on the old Twitter machines. So check him out there ahead of the paywall. Always nice to see some free content out there. We're big fans of such things like that here. Mr. Sean, if folks want some free content from you guys, maybe I just want to hit you up with some questions. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, it's easy. FTSERussell.com for information or just S. Smith at FTSERussell.com. Happy to answer questions. Happy to share information. There's just a, a just a tremendous wealth of information on our website. There's there's former webinars. You can you can just slash webinars at the end of our website at the end of our um, at the end of our URL and you know footsierussell.com slash webinars or um, just email me and I'm happy to send you some links for some really good information on large caps versus small caps index performance. Um, it's it's all fantastic information and I'm happy to share it. And um, Russell, it's just great to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in person at some some time on the on the back side of this stuff going on are, right now. So are you up? I, are you in Illinois? I am. I'm like right over 294 know, from you. I know where you are. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give away. I, I accidentally once I blurted out where you lived, so I'm not going to do that again. But you're close to me. So, yeah, we, we, should, figure, we should figure out a time to get together and I will send you a message. We have a socially yeah, a nice little town right between <laughs> us, which would be a yep. great rendezvous. 
We can arrange a socially distant Russell-related play date. Footsie Russell and Mr. Russell Rhodes. I like the idea of that. Check them out while you're at it, Mr. Listeners out there. FootsieRussell.com. Give them a follow on the old Twitters as well, at Footsie Russell. Looking at their site right now. A lot of great stuff on coronavirus. Of course, those webinars Sean's talking about. All those recordings are over there. And a whole heck of a lot more. FootsieRussell.com. And, of course, you know where to find CME. CMEgroup.com slash Twifo or slash Twio are the places to go for our reports in between episodes of this program and of course all the great research from eric and everybody else over there as well so check it out and on behalf of sean and mr rhodes and our friends over there at cme and indeed myself i thank all of you out there for downloading streaming subscribing for listening live for sending in your questions as cynical as they are <laughs> and a lot more i want to thank all of you out there and we'll see you back here tomorrow noon central back to the old time for volatility views and it kicks off again on monday with the option block all the way through to thursday for more of this week in futures options this week in futures options is brought to you by cme group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange cme groups markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities cme group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes including interest rates equity indexes foreign exchange energy agriculture and metals for more information and educational resources about futures options at cme group Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.